Well, amen. And hence, Joy Mays, it's great to hear you all planning in. Great to see you all out there in our congregation. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this morning together. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So be the world that he his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. taught us great things he has done and great a rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name.
God, we are grateful to be in this place this morning and have the opportunity to worship you together as church family, both through music and the teaching of the word. God, we've longed for this day for many, many weeks, and we're grateful uh, for it to be a reality this morning that we can join together. And God, we want nothing more uh, than uh, to, to lift our voices in praise to you, and to, to receive the teaching of, of your word with eager hearts that we may be transformed to look more and more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. We made it. <laughs> Somewhat, right? Like we're not all the way there, but we are here, here in person, and we are so glad to see you this morning. Um, this is truly a groundbreaking day at First Baptist Church in that, uh, to my knowledge, I don't know that we've ever streamed uh, the 11 o'clock service on Facebook Live. And so we're doing that this morning. As, as you're sitting here, we're sending this out to uh, many of our families and folks who have been watching. Um, and so I just want to say a special welcome to those who are watching online this morning. If, if you're a guest either here this morning or online, would love to connect with you. Uh, let us know that you are here or that you're watching online, and we will be glad to follow up with you. I uh, just wanted to say a few things as we, as we get started in, in this kind of slow process of, of moving things back to some sort of, of normal routine. Uh, first, and you've already noticed this morning, uh, there's going to be a lot of, of inconvenience. There's going to be a lot of new. There's going to be a lot of things that we haven't had to do before. And, and we know that these things are temporary. And so we ask that you just be gracious and patient as we learn. Every Sunday throughout the last 15 weeks has been a learning experience for your staff for your deacons, for, for those who are serving behind the scenes. As each week it seems like there's something new that we're either rolling out or that we're focusing on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of preparation to, to make sure that not only uh, do things sound right in this building and, and that we're able to maintain distance in this building, but that we've created overflow spaces and to make sure that what you are seeing and hearing here in this room is also just as clear in the student building and in the gym and so there's a lot of work that's gone into to making this happen, and I'm grateful for um, all the folks who have been working diligently to make uh, this Sunday a reality for us. When you dismiss today, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, there will not be a formal offering time in, in the service. Uh, we're trying to limit contact and, and people touching the same items. And so uh, there are baskets that are set up that you will place your offering in, um, as you dismiss this morning. What we're going to do, just for the sake of trying to limit, because I think you guys understand, you've been here long enough to know that when we dismiss this service at 11 o'clock, uh, it's a huge bottleneck in the back. Everyone's waiting to get out. So what we're going to do is this side over here to my right, you guys are going to actually leave through this door, and you're going to go through either the flower room or the back, and that's how you'll dismiss. There's an offering basket here. This group here on my left you guys will, will go that way and out the doors that way, okay? So that way we're limiting traffic in, in different locations. Again, uh, it's just something that for the time being we need to do. Um, I hope that you, you don't feel too much. I was joking with, with Jerry and Lynn a minute ago uh, that you don't feel too much like cattle um, being separated the way that you guys are. Um, we, uh, we thought long and hard about how to do this and how to do this well, and, and so this is the system that... <laughs> This is the best Sean and I could come up with, all right? And so um, we appreciate your grace in that. Uh, just want to remind you, those of who you are watching online, uh, we're grateful for your willingness to, to give and support our, our ministry. Uh, you can give online, you can give via text, uh, mail, or you can give in person. Um, but we are so excited to be back. We have longed for this day. And, and I, I told the, the early services this morning, that I hope that, that what this has done in your life personally is, one, is that you've experienced the fullness of Christ, um, even though we've been apart uh, for 15 or so weeks, um, and that you have been reminded of how necessary it is that we are able to do this. And so I, I hope that you um, have, have missed this and that you're excited to be back. I know that there are many, many watching who want to be here. Uh, we can't wait for you to be here um, when, when things kind of ease up a little bit. And so... Uh, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. I'm going to pray and we're going to continue to worship. Let's pray. God, we um, ask again just that you be magnified in this place, that you be exalted. Um, God, we're, we're grateful to, 
to be able to do ministry, and even if it looks a little bit different, um, God, we're grateful to be here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joy, thank you. Goodness gracious, we're blessed. God is so good. He's so good to each and every one of us. Remain seated. Let's sing together. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. so I love him so I love him so I love him so he's so good to me praise his name I praise his name I praise his his name I praise his name he's so good to me Jesus 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 there's just something about that name Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. 
and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about madname. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground for the Lord is present and where he is is holy this is holy ground we're standing on holy ground for the Lord is present and where he is stand with us on this last stanza please these are holy hands he's given us holy hands he works through these hands and so these hands are holy these are holy hands he's given us holy hands he works through these hands, and so these hands are holy. We are standing holy ground, and I know that there standing in his presence on holy ground we are standing on holy ground and i know that there are angels all around Let Thank you. Be seated. No, sir. Good morning. Let's see if I'm here. Am I here? Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah? Okay. I couldn't hear myself. I'm crazy. Well, I'm glad we are in this place together. We are finally having opportunity, at least to a certain extent, to be around one another. I know that it's, uh, it's frankly, it's a little weird. Uh, we, we are in a season of life that is, uh, man, it's just different. <clears throat> everywhere you go, everywhere you look, it's, it's crazy. You turn on the television, it's crazy. You go into town, it's crazy. You turn on the news, it's crazy. You get on the internet, it's crazy. Everything is a daggum mess. <laughs> but we serve a sovereign God who is in control. Redemption is the title of the sermon today. It, it, honestly, it's a word that carries such weight. And if we are honest with ourselves, as we've gone through the book of Ruth, there's been a powerful piece of redemption from beginning to end. And in that picture of redemption, what I want to, us to be reminded of, just like we see God's sovereignty coming to play in the book of Ruth, God's sovereignty is coming to play in the here and now too. Because, look, I, I know that, that when, we, when we turn on the news or we look out at the world and we see the chaos that is, that is taking place, we say, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what God's doing. I don't, I don't see what God is doing. 
But I just want to remind you of something. It's taken us, this is going to be our, our fourth week in the book of Ruth. It's taken us four weeks to look at uh, Ruth and Naomi's life. The majority of their life, it's taken us four weeks to look at. We, we, come, we get to approach the Bible with, with hindsight. We get to approach the Bible having a, the, the whole story told to us in just a couple of weeks. Or if we wanted to, you could sit down and read the entire book of Ruth in, in 15 minutes. And you'd get the, the whole picture of it, but this was their life. They were living these things out, just like we're living in these moments now. So we can't always see what God is doing, but we can trust that He is a sovereign God and that He is a good God. Find your way over to Ruth chapter 4. We're going to begin reading here in just a few moments. Redemption. Powerful word. To be redeemed, to be ransomed, to be bought back. To be those who are under God's plan of redemption. Uh, I've said this every time uh, this morning that I've preached, and I've said this many, many times in, in my ministry, that when you look at Scripture, what you see as a whole is creation, fall, and redemption. Creation, fall, and redemption. The first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you find creation and the fall. The remaining 1,186 chapters in the Bible, you find God's story of redemption. It is one thread that is being woven through throughout the history of things, and we're going to see that culminating today in the book of Ruth. We're going to see how God, in the, on, the, on the forefront, on the foreground, it looks like, you know, I, I told you, maybe a, a warm, fuzzy Hallmark movie on the Lifetime channel, this love story of Ruth and Boaz. But there is such a deeper picture, such a, a, a broader picture about God's plan of redemption and what He is not only in the midst of doing in their lives, but ultimately what He's going to do for lives throughout eternity. And so join with me in chapter 4, and we're going to read through these 22 verses. Now Boaz went up to the gate, and he sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside and he sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and he said, Sit down here. So they sat down. And then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, after I, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have the right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And so he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech, that belong to Chilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife, in order to raise up the name of the deceased and of his inheritance. So that name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers, from his brothers, or from the court of his birthplace, where you are witnesses today. All the people who were in the court and the older said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, whom both of built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in <coughs> Ephrathath and become, and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore Judah. Therefore, the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. This last section of verses is going to seem like just a genealogy, but it has some importance. 
Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor woman gave him the name, saying, A son has been given to Naomi. And they named him Obed. His father, he is the father of Jesse, and the father of David. Now the generations of Perez, to Perez was born Hezron, to Hezron born Ram, and to Ram, Amminadab, and to Amminadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon, Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed, and to Obed, Jesse, and to Jesse, David. Lots of names there. That are, that are going to have some significance as we get towards the end of unpacking this passage together. Third chapter of Ruth, just a couple weeks ago, we were kind of left with a cliffhanger moment. Ruth and Boaz were having a conversation on the threshing floor. He, he sent her home with a whole bunch of grain to, to feed their family. And so, but he, he said, we're going to find out if this closer relative will redeem you or not, and if not, I will redeem you, but we're left not knowing. There's a closer relative that has the, the first opportunity, and so what's going to take place? He's going to go to the gates. The gates of the city were a place of commerce. It was the place of business. It was a, where in, important assemblies would happen. If there was an exchanging of, of property, if there were legal transactions, if there were judgments to be made, it would happen at the city gates. It's the city square. It's an area of, of prominence. And so Boaz goes to this place. We can set the narrative, the stage for what is taking place. Now, I don't think it's by accident that when he gets there, the closer relative just happens to be walking by. Talk about the sovereignty of God bringing into play exactly what he meant at that time. Now, the English translation does something a little bit different here. Uh, in, in these first set of verses, it says, Turn aside, friend, and sit down here. Uh, but in the original language, in the Hebrew, it actually doesn't refer to him as friend or, or by name. It's kind of a, a Hebrew idiom that basically equates to the idea of, Hey, Mr. So-and-so. Hey, hey, John Doe, come over here and sit down. And so th he begins to, to explain to this closer relative what's going on, what is taking place. That Naomi has returned from the land of Moab, and she has a piece of property that needs to be sold. Now, it is this man's uh, moral responsibility to purchase the land. Now, it, it is voluntary, of course, but it, they're supposed to be doing this according to the, the laws that were laid out for the people of God. So... If he does not purchase the property, then Boaz is the next in line with responsibility. Mr. So-and-so says that he'll redeem it. So when we first read the passage, we get to this section where, uh, you know, Boaz is like, I'll redeem you, and, you know, if this, if this closer one doesn't. We get to this section where it's like, oh no, the love story might be at an end. Oh my goodness, she's not going to get to marry Boaz. But there's, there's more to the story than, than just that. Because as soon as he says, all right, you can redeem the land, and by the way, when you do, you're going to marry Ruth, too. That's just the appropriate thing for you to do. And all of a sudden, we get, whoa, hold your horses. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this closer relative had a girlfriend or something or what the deal was. The scripture's not exactly clear. But once Ruth becomes involved with it, he wants to back off. He wants to give the right of redemption to, to Boaz, and so the transaction takes place. And then we see this, this picture of them trading sandals. Uh, you know, it, it's basically a customary thing that they were showing respect and, and how they made this deal and there were witnesses that were involved. Now, legally, neither man is bound to marry her, but they, it doesn't erase their moral responsibility to, to redeem her, to redeem both Ruth and Naomi and the property. And so Boaz is appealing to the, the near family redeemer and saying, look, you know, marriage doesn't have to be a part of the deal, but it should be a part of the deal. And so why does the, this fellow reject her? Well, we don't know clearly. Maybe it'll damage his inheritance. Maybe it'll hurt his reputation. Maybe there's, there's some reason, but we don't know exactly why, other than the fact that we know that a sovereign God has got things already planned, and he's laying out the order of those things, and we're getting to see it play out piece by piece. So Mr. So-and-so gives up his rights to Boaz. And he, he says that he doesn't need to redeem her. And so Boaz says... I will redeem you, Ruth. And so it begins this process. It begins the story of, of her becoming his wife. Now, after we see the, the stage is set, then what we're going to see for the next section of, the, of the, the passage is how God blesses. God is going to bless beyond imagine. He's going to bless over and over and over again. We're going to see him bless Naomi. We're going to see him bless Ruth. We're going to see then him bless future generations. The elders in the city are aware, they're witnesses to this transaction, and they then begin to declare blessings upon Ruth and Naomi. 
It's interesting how this takes place. The, the first thing they say is Ruth is likened to, to Rachel and Leah that will build up and strengthen Israel. You may not realize how big of a statement that is. Rachel and Leah were the wives of Jacob who were born to them 12 sons. Those 12 sons would become the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so she is likened to, to Rachel or Leah. And with that blessing they're speaking on to her, then they compare her to, to Tamar who lost her husband and was childless, but then was blessed through Perez. These elders were proclaiming a blessing on Ruth, and it's, it's this idea of a complete reversal of fortune. Going from empty to being full, going from, from outside to being inside. Ruth was married for 10 years to Malon and didn't have any children. And we see God at work in verse 13 where he says, He gave to her a child, a son. And in verse 13, there's another statement that she became his wife. Now, this is a, an unusual Hebrew word in the way it depicts, a, it's, it's a changing of status. I want you to bear with me for just a moment. When we were in uh, Ruth chapter 2, Ruth was, was referred to as the foreigner. Ruth the foreigner, the Moabitess. This was her title. This is who she was. When she showed up in town in Bethlehem, she was the foreigner, the outsider, the cast off. Then, all of a sudden, we see this transition later on in chapter 2, where she becomes known as a servant. She's a servant in the field of Boaz. Now, <coughs> the title, the word servant, used that first time, is actually a lower level word of servant. Excuse me, I'm grabbing a bottle of water. It's a lower level of servant. And so uh, the, the title for her then goes from, from foreigner to servant. And then there's another transition that goes on later in chapter 2, towards the end of chapter 2, where she becomes maid servant. So it's, again, a changing of her title, of her recognition. And finally, we arrive at a place now in chapter 4 where she's even at, at, a, at a greater level where she becomes wife, where she goes from outsider to insider, where she goes from outcast to family. This is a transition that God is taking her through in the midst of his sovereignty. And it is reflective of how God works out in our salvation the same thing. We go from being outsiders to being ins uh, insiders. We go from outside the covenant without hope to inside the covenant with hope through Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. This is a foreshadowing of all of that. This is a typology uh, of the picture of, of Christ that is the provision of salvation. And so he says, he says look, this blessing that is being poured out onto you, man, it is a, it is a transition from, from outside to inside. And it's a huge thing that's taking place in the life of Ruth. And it is a blessing for her. It's a blessing for us to see this. And it's a blessing that continually is poured out. But that's not the only blessing. These women come to, not to, to address Ruth, but also to address Naomi. They say, bless the Lord because he has not left you without a redeemer. He says, God's name should be praised. He says, look, you, you, you were not left without a restorer, even in your older age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you greater than seven sons could ever love you, has given birth to a son, and through that you will be blessed. Your descendant will be a restorer, will be a sustainer. Naomi's future is now secure. God's promise is resting true for her. Ruth, in her virtue, has been so worthy to Naomi. And so they even attribute this son now to Naomi. They say, a son is born, born to you. Naomi, you've been delivered, you've been rescued, you've been sustained. Her hope in God had not proven false. Now this is where I want to just remind us of something that is, it is, that is important for us to hear. I told you guys that when we read scripture, we get to read it in, you know, in one big chunk all at one time. We get to see the whole story. They were living this life out. The, you know, Naomi had become bitter because her husband had died, her two sons had died, she had no grandchildren, her and Ruth had no hope, they crawled back to Bethlehem. They hoped to find some food just eking out an existence in the corner of a field, gleaning what little they could. And yet God is going to take this unbelievable reversal of fortunes. And I'm not saying that you're, you know, you're Ruth, you're the, you're, the, you're the picture of Ruth, but we can relate to this as we read through this text. And maybe you're in a season of life right now, or maybe you've been in a season of life for a very long time, for an extended period of time, where you say, I can't see what God is doing. You know, we, we get to read this in four weeks, but in actuality, they were living this out in their life. They had been in Moab for 10 years during that time where they, her husband and her sons would die. So this is a, a story of a lifetime, and maybe you're in a season of life or an extended period of time where you are struggling to see what God is doing and where he is moving, and you can't see a blessing in the future. You can't see anything that is good. Well, what I get from this is this idea of hold on. 
hold fast to the sovereign God that we serve, that he is still in the midst of doing good things. He says, look, he has not proven false. He has rescued, he has redeemed, and he has sustained. So not only does he pour out this, this blessing on, on Ruth and this blessing on Naomi, but what we're going to see is that God continues to bless because he gives hope for the future. Hope for the future. This whole book is, is that purpose, is redemption, is hope for the future. It is the promise of hope that is given to us, the blessing of hope for our lives. We see the providence of God can change the course of a life, taking it from empty to full, not just in Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, but in, in Sean and, and, and Jimmy and, and everyone who is in this room. God is in the business of, of changing lives, taking people from where they once were to where they can be. It's interesting. You go a few weeks without preaching three times in a row. First time you come back and preach three times in a row, you, you, can't, breathe, you can't speak hardly. This is driving me nuts. Maybe it's the Sahara desert dust or whatever it is that, you know, we're playing Jumanji around here, aren't we? It's crazy. <coughs> but look, you know, God is, God is doing such great things and he's blessing. He's blessing in, in Ruth's life and Naomi's life and the blessings continue into our life. Ultimately, it's the story of salvation is what's being played out here. It's a story of redemption, it, it, uh, you know, on a, on a grander scale, on a small scale, and on a grander scale, in their lives and for all of our lives, that God is moving things from empty to full. God is richly blessing his people, and we can draw out so much from the end of this book, because look, at the, at the very end of it, it might just appear like a genealogy, like just a listing of names, but look carefully. A son who is born is Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. David, ultimately his line leads to Jesus. The messianic line for the rescue mission, for salvation that the world needs, is being maintained, is being sustained here. Obed means the, the one who helps, the one who serves. This child who is coming is a, is a foreshadowing of the servant, the ultimate suffering servant who would come and pay the price for us. In the dark days of the judges, God's covenant righteousness is seen. And if we dig into this for just a few minutes, we can see that this is a typology of Christ, that this is foreshadowing this mission of rescue that he came on. So we dig into this and we, we understand that this one who is going to be the redeemer of Israel, this one who would be the restorer, the sustainer, is coming. And this promises it. Our first picture of this is how we see God you know, using Gentiles, using foreigners, an outsider, a Moabite, to bring into his covenant relationship. God uses this to, to show that Gentiles are going to be full participants in his plan to save the world. That God is bringing those from the outside to the inside. That God's kingdom was going to explode to the world uh, by outsiders, by Gentiles. They were being brought into the covenant family. And this is, you know, should stand out to us that this Moabite having no status, being outside, is brought inside and becomes a servant and then is given full access as wife in the change of her title. But then the greatest change in her title is from outside to inside the family of God. This is a big change for her and this is the biggest change that can happen for us. God is going to use outsiders to bring into his kingdom, not as second class citizens or lower king, but full access to God on the same level as Israel. And so this is the beauty of what God is doing. God is showing that this, through this marriage of, of Boaz and Ruth that he's going to enter into a covenant relationship with all of the world. They're no longer considered outsiders. What was defiled, what was unclean before is no longer considered that. And God is depicting this in the book of Ruth. <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning verse 11, it says these words. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which made <clears throat> which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and that might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and he preached to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. If 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is a, there's a lot that's being said there, and it's, it's carrying over from what is going on in Ruth about ultimately God bringing those outside inside. Think about this. Jesus repeated this even through his life. Those who were unclean, the, the lepers, the Samaritans, the, the prostitutes of society would, would come to Jesus for, for cleansing and for healing. They would come, and if, if a leper touched somebody, that, that person would be also considered unclean. But if, if a leper touched Christ, that person would be healed. God is doing what we cannot God is, is healing where we cannot. God is restoring what we cannot. God is removing defilement. That's why we see even in Acts chapter 10 when, when he gives the, the Peter the, the dream, the vision, he says to him, he says, you know, I've made things clean. Don't call them common. So this is a, a, a powerful picture of hope for the future that, that he is giving, that is, is showing up even in the book of Ruth. Finally, we can also see this picture of, of Bethlehem. In, in the very beginning of this book, we, we see Bethlehem show up. And, you know, we always think of a little town of Bethlehem. We, we think about Christmas time. We think about this little, you know, this town of Bethlehem. But Bethlehem's even showing up right here. Think about this. This is Ruth. This is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. This is not the Gospels. This is long, long before that. This little town of Bethlehem shows up. Hmm, strange. No, sovereign God. And God is in the midst of doing something even there in this place, in this small town. In Micah, we see a foreshadowing of this. We see a prophecy of this. But you, O, ta- o Bethlehem, you're too little among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler of all of Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time where he who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. My goodness, this is a foreshadowing of of the the promise of Christ in his birth. Out of Bethlehem would come a a ruler of Israel, the one who would be our peace, the one who would be their peace. Through Christ, God takes us from empty and makes us full. He changes our status. He changes our identity. He brings us redemption. God takes that which is broken and fixes it. God takes that which is ruined and he restores it. God takes that which is corrupted by sin and he redeems it. He buys it back. He cleanses it and he heals it. Through our our darkness, this, this piercing light comes in of God to give us the provision of salvation, to sustain us. He is our Lord, and in functioning this way for us, He becomes our Savior, our Sustainer, our Provider. Yes, in, in, in this whole book of Ruth, we see Boaz as a, as a Christ-like figure. And, and you know, at the, at the front of it, I told you, it's a warm, fuzzy Hallmark movie that it's just a, a love story. But the, the, on the grander scale, this is God painting a picture of how He plans to redeem His people, on how He's going to rescue on those, who, uh, those of us who are, those of us, when I say those of us, it's us. All of us who are outside of the gospel, who are outside of the family of God, until he comes pursuing us through Christ, who is our Savior. So we put our faith in God, and we love him for what he's done, and he changes our lives from those that are hopeless to ones that can have hope. I want to read a, a quote from one commentator who, who spoke uh, about the, concerning the, this little book of Ruth. This book and this genealogy demonstrate that in the dark days of the judges, the chosen line is preserved not by heroic exploits, by deliverers or kings, but by the good hand of God, who rewards good people with a fullness beyond all imagination. In the dark days of the judges, the foundation is laid for the line that would produce the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer of lost. It's a powerful thing for us to understand that redemption is, was God's plan all along. That redemption was God's idea. That he came that he might rescue us. From this little book of Ruth, I hope you've seen a story of, of not just love, but a greater story of love and one of hope, where God has come to redeem and to restore us. Now, I, I spoke about this just a few minutes ago, but I want to address it again. Um, culture is crazy right now. The world is, is absolutely nuts. And as we are those who have been redeemed, we have a responsibility to be carriers of that redemption, which means that we are gospel people, that we speak the gospel, that we live the gospel, that we live it out with, with the idea that comes you know, from Philippians, that considering the, the needs of others is more significant than our own. We live in such a way where we conduct ourselves appropriately, where we speak with a tongue that looks like Christ, where we, where we yes, we can boldly pro- proclaim and preach the gospel, but uh, guess what? The gospel and, and American politics are not the same thing. And so 
you know, please, if you think that's the case, shut up. Because you're doing, yeah, you're doing more damage to the gospel than you are any good. And so I say that with absolute, I mean, I, I mean that with love. I really do. But we need to, to be appropriate in the way that we seek to engage in a culture that is going crazy. But in the midst of that crazy chaos, God is sovereign and God is good. And we should trust in him. Let's pray. Lord, we are, are so glad that even though it's a bit, a bit strange, we can still be in this place. Even though it, it's, it's different and, and maybe a chore to do things differently, we, we thank you for just a day to come back. God, I thank you for your word, for how the, the story of Ruth and, and Naomi and Boaz shows for us how you are a redeemer. God, our world so desperately needs redemption, redemption right now. It needs a redeemer. Uh, beyond all else, it, we need you to, to send your spirit in a, in a unique way. God, as we seek to engage our world with the gospel, help us to be people with redemption in mind. God, we love you and we thank you for the promise of your son that gave us the hope of being redeemed by you. In whose name we pray, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Sweet tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling a sinner. Come home. For those of you who are here today, thank you so much for being here. For those of you who are tuning in at home, we thank you for, for worshiping with us. God loves you. We do too. Trust in His sovereignty. Go in his grace and carry that redemption of gospel people to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Have a great day. We're going to close today because he lives. Because he lives. We talk about hope for the future in this. In this don't, don't let us lose that wonderful message, hope for the future, man. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know who holds the future, and let's sing it together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the God bless you. You know how to exit. Thank you.